first ever virtual how-to meeting. Uh, we have an exciting webinar planned for you all here today uh, where we'll be going through some helpful tips and tricks on how to get your field view account up and running for this uh, spring seeding season. Uh, before we get going here, uh, first I want to thank everyone for adjusting to our, our change in plan uh, to host this webinar and for taking the time to tune in and, uh, and join us, so thank you. Uh, we are hoping to keep this webinar as in interactive as possible. So uh, as we go through the presentation, please feel free to type out your question. Uh, there's a section on the right side of the screen here where you can do that. Uh, we will be typing back uh, answers to the questions, so we'll keep the, the flow of the presentation going and, and try to keep up with the questions. Um, that being said, if you do think of something after the meeting is over, uh, that's no problem at all. Uh, just know anything that we will be going through here today. Uh, you can also find on our climatefieldview.ca website uh, under our Knowledge Center. So uh, really, really helpful. Uh, we'll be going through that. Uh, we'll also be uploading some uh, videos to um, YouTube, sorry. Uh, also, I'd like to make mention there's an account here on the screen for those of you that do not have your own FieldView account uh, currently. Uh, this is a demo account that anybody can log in and kind of follow along and, and see where we're at. So feel free to use that. You do need the apps download to log in there. Also, we are also very happy to provide some CCA credits for those of you taking part in this webinar. So to be sure that you get these credits, uh, there will be a short survey at the end of the presentation uh, where you'll put your credentials in and you will get these credits. So before we get rolling here, uh, I just want to quickly introduce our Western Canada Field View team uh, who are all on today's webinar. So if we can switch the screen there, thank you. Uh, starting with our climate business managers, we have Sarah Uzik uh, out in Alberta. We have Troy Pozowski in northern Saskatchewan, uh, who also takes care of the Parkland region in Manitoba. And uh, myself, uh, Chapin Bell, I cover uh, Manitoba and southern Saskatchewan or uh, as someone, some, some of us call it uh, God's country. So moving on to our climate <laughs> business managers. Yeah, I that you like that, Troy. Moving on to our climate business manager associates. We have Rosemary Dwight out in Alberta, uh, Corey Brash in uh, Saskatchewan, who lives in the parkland, and Brett Brooks in Manitoba. And lastly, we cannot forget our field product specialist, Andrea Karstens. Uh, Andrea is based out of Saskatoon, but uh, spends some of her time in all three provinces, so very mobile. Okay, with uh, everyone being introduced, we might as well get this thing going. So uh, today we will be reviewing the FieldView Cab app, uh, the full app, uh, as well as climatefieldview.ca. So spending a little time throughout the three, um, and climatefieldview.ca is where we're going to get started. So. Where we kind of start in field view and how we get going is uh, learning how to map and import field boundaries. So with that being said, uh, Andrew and Troy, please take it away. Thanks a lot for that, Chaps. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so we're going to take you down a field view journey. Get comfortable. It's going to take, um, you know, probably an hour and a half. We'll, uh, we'll get, you, get you done here before lunch, though. We'll do what we can. Um, just to let everybody know that these will be recorded and, and you'll be sent a link. So anybody that's pre-registered for this and, and you know, if there's some reason you have to sneak off, uh, please don't, but if there's a reason you have to sneak off, um, they will be, there will be YouTube links sent to you. So there'll be some sort of playlist that'll have uh, each section sort of broken out for you. So um, just wanted to make everybody aware of that. And, uh, you know, a lot of people ask me the, the value and the why on field view and, and um, I just kind of wanted to start off with how I position it with a lot of people. Uh, when I talk about field view, I think that um, the keeners, the people that, that do really well on it the first couple of years, um, use it to start collecting their data and, and using that information and that data for trials. So they essentially treat each field like an individual um, trial site. We call it market development site, so TD site, um, some place where you can Go and you can test out different applications that you're doing, whether it's um, a product that you're using or whether it's a way that you're, um, you know, an agronomic practice. So maybe it's seeding rate, seeding speed, maybe it's seeding depth, or perhaps um, fertility, the amount that you're putting with the seed or, or in the sideband. Tools like FieldView allow us to easily track that and then analyze it at the end of the year. So 
that's kind of the big one for me coming from the technical background and the agronomy background. And then um, also, I, I think that when we think about the, the broader picture, um, this is a bear crop sizes digital platform. And this is a way that we're going to be able to bring value to our customers in the form of warranties and guarantees in the future. So you'll hear more more stuff coming coming out this spring and, and throughout the summer about um, offers that we have on how we're warranting and guaranteeing our, our fungicides. But, you know, I, I know as farmers, our margins are tighter and tighter every year, and we're trying to find ways to, um, to get the manufacturer to share in the risk. You know, it's something we've heard time and time again. So this is something that... Um, that we're able to do is is once we start collect data and information, we're able to use that to warranty our products for our customers. So that's kind of a couple of the big ones that I just wanted to remind people of. But um, I'm going to stop um, rambling on about that, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to get Andrea to help me uh, dive right into it. And and um, Andrea, let's start off with some uh, creating some field um, some field boundaries. So first of all, we've got Andrea to to go on to climatefieldview.ca. And um, before we get going, I'm gonna get her to just kind of point out some of the top taskbars that she has there. So pricing is probably the big one that I want you guys to look at. And just so you know, because I know a lot of people are coming off the one year try it before you buy it. And if you haven't bought yet, you can see in that middle column, that's the try it before you buy it. That's where you would subscribe for it. And that's all of the options you get. And if you scroll down a little bit further, you can put in your number of acres. So it's basically a dollar an acre sliding scale or a dollar an acre to a thousand acres. And then once you go over that thousand acres, so if you go 2,500 acres, Andrea, it would be, um, it's, it's basically a sliding scale up to 10,000 acres. So the tool maxes out at $3,000. So you could have 250. 25,000 acres, sorry, and, um, and be $3,000 annual subscription. So, and that'll give you access to everything that we're going over today. And, um, and the only um, thing that I'll mention, I guess, is there is some seed scripting stuff, but it's, it's not as uh, applicable to a lot of us. Um, it's more for the corn and soybean planters. So maybe some of our people out in, and I'm using air quotes here, God's country, um, maybe some of those folks out there um, are on uh, would be a you know wanting to use something like that. So, so that's where we would find pricing. Um, you know, I'm going to throw a quick shout out to support. Um, that's the second tab on the top that Andrea is clicking, and and our support channel. Uh, they're they're quite unique. They're they're really good. They've got um, this is a group of individuals in North America here that have a close ties with the farm. They have uh, really good knowledge on data and information, and they sit beside the engineers and sit beside people that, you know, um, that, that do the manufacturing and the groundwork of, of this, um, of creating this tool. So when there are issues, they, they've got the people right beside them. They've got a wall full of all the different monitors that we offer in, in North America. So when you're having those issues, they can go over and, um, and help you out with that. So, I, I do, you know, that's kind of our frontline staff. If, if you are having um, issues in the spring or you, you, you can't remember exactly maybe how to connect something or how to do something, I'd invite you to, uh, to call these guys up. They're, they're the ones with the bandwidth and the knowledge on this. So Andrea's went into the bottom there, and, and this is the number. You guys can write it down. You'll find it in a lot of different places on both our, our CAB app, the white app, and then the full app, which is the black app, you'll find that in, in there too. So we'll be reviewing that, but the number is 888 And this is where we'd find anything from compatibility to um, just even getting started. Um, and, you know, use the search bar. So a lot of people ask me one of the most common questions I get is, hey, what iPad do I need? So even if Andrea puts in their iPad, she can push enter, and there's going to be some articles that come up here. Um, the second article down there, oh, I guess, yeah, it was the first one. Um, just toggle down. I think it was the second one. So this one actually tells you, yeah, exactly which model number you have, how to find out which model number, which are the ones we supported. When I first seen this screen, I thought, holy smokes, is there ever a lot of iPads? I didn't realize that there was that many um, different ones. But um you know, sometimes um, Apple isn't allowing those older generations to update to the software that we need to run 
field view. So, um, so that's where you would find information like that. So that's kind of what I wanted to touch on. Um, you guys obviously found the events page on our, um, on our field view account. So that was the next tab up. Um, and that event page brought us to here. So uh, we also have a climate blog, but um, let's, uh, did, I, did I miss anything, Andrea, there, or anything that we want to? Uh... Nope, I think that sounds good. Yeah, let's log right in. So I've logged in before, just so we didn't have to wait for it to load. Um, but if you want to follow along, feel free to uh, join us, log in either with that demo account that Chapin mentioned or your own account, and you can follow along with us here. So the first thing we want to do is we want to map a field. And when we add a new field, um, you know, we can use um, the add, add new field button in the bottom left corner. Now I'm going to zoom in and find my field here. I have a field near Menon, so I'm just going to zoom in. If you have a even your postal code or the Latin longs of your field, unfortunately you can't enter in um, lab locations, but it might help you find it. If you have a, your postal code, just get you a little closer. Um, I'm going to zoom in here. Now that I've found my field, we can pick a name for that field. So, Troy, what should we name our field today? Um, let's go with Dr. Money. Maybe a big this yielder? Is, this is the one that pays off. This is the big field. You bet. Client? Client um, will go peat bog. Sorry? Just a peat, actually. And farm? Um, let's go traps. Perfect. Once you have your field all named, um, to draw that boundary, we can click on this draw button up here in the top uh, right-hand corner. I usually start with a polygon. And click on the corner of my field to start. And to finish that box, click on that first point that you put down. Now, the nice thing about this is Andrea's got the nice square box, but there's obviously a lot of areas in that field that we're not, um, we're not seeding, we're not combining, we're not spraying, such as that, that big slough there. So we're going to have to remove some areas and, and just go up to that next box, hit remove. Polygon again is probably the best way to go for now. We'll show you some of the other ones. And then just, yeah, um, you can zoom in and be as accurate as you want and as close as you want. Uh, the reason that we want to be accurate here is when we look at satellite images, we don't want to be pulling up satellite images that have, you know, let's say a water body in the middle of it and it would show just as black so it would show no vegetation or if we had you know, a, a bush and, and lots of trees and vegetation, it would show it as, it would just throw our entire filter off. So, so now that Andrea has uh, kind of the boundary made, she can zoom in and, and do a little ground truth. It looks really good. If you look in that top left, uh, kind of, I'm going to call it the northwest corner, there's a, there's a tree row there. And, and what we want to do there is we want to take out, we want to remove an area. And there's a, another remove option that I quite like for tree rows fence rows or waterways and we call it waterways on here so click on waterway and Andrea can can start that tree row at the edge of the field where it goes and then all the way down into that field into the middle there and then she'll have to double click the line and then it'll ask for how wide it is so it's about 20 feet So I'd invite you folks to um, take a look at all of your fields, make sure that they're all entered in. Um, you know, even if, uh, let's say you're, you're um, a dealer and you've got some trials that you're doing with some of your customers and you're gonna be using FieldView, uh, pre-map those fields. So then you can get the satellite images coming in right away. And you'll also get those satellite images from the previous three years. 
Some people are even using this to look at land that they're possibly um, going to acquire or thinking about putting a bid on. So then they can, you know, really nail down the, the amount of acres that are actually there. If you look on the left side, it has approximate acres. So after we've removed the stuff that isn't um, farmable, then we have uh, that 287 acres is, is kind of what we would be able to sow in this scenario. Okay. So if you are happy with how your boundaries look and you've removed everything uh, in your field, you can go ahead and hit save. You can see then that field will add to our list of fields here, Dr. Money down there and um, be able to see that it'll be marked as a little point like my other fields when I zoom out. So one other question while we're here that we often get is at editing field boundaries. Um, so if you hit this edit field up at the top beside that, beside that search bar, um, when I hit that edit field button, you can see that my fields all get a little paper and pencil show up beside them. So if I wanted to edit any of those field boundaries, I could tap on that edit button and it's gonna bring up um, those little dots just like when I had drawn my field boundaries. So now if I wanted to make this field a bit bigger, I can just drag those points out. Um, maybe this year I wanna feed this all as one field instead of two. I can make those adjustments like that and then hit save. And that's how we would edit field boundaries if we ever needed to go back and do so. So, um, it's pretty, um, pretty straightforward once we're creating our field boundaries. Um, you know, it's uh, it's one of those things that I think that everybody um, everybody needs to be able to to do. There's other ways that we can do it. We can also ingest it. So a lot of people have their field boundaries made already, or they have them in another file type, and we're actually able to import them. So what we what we do recommend is is uh, you know there's a lot of farmers out there with 40 fields or more, and and um, if you don't have the time or the bandwidth, then then I would pull the the USB drive out of your out of your sprayer or be able to download those field boundaries out of those on a USB and then you'd go into this import tab that Andrea is hovering over top. So once you click on import you can see here I have imported some in the past and they do get broken out into different different file types. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I'll just click into the harvest to show you what it would look like. Don't be alarmed if you are importing and things come up in tons of different file chunks. That's just the way our equipment monitors are collecting those uh, data points and those data files in lots of different chunks. Um, so for instance, this field had, had 49 different pieces of that harvest map. On, when we were on that Climate Field View homepage and in that support, there's a lot of articles about using data inbox and uploading our data in there if this is something that you want to do. Um, also, if you've spoken to a climate activation specialist when you signed up, they can help you with this as well. Also, YouTube has some great videos on how to do that. And like Troy mentioned, of course, if you do run into trouble when you're trying to upload anything through the data inbox, um, definitely give that support team, the support team a call. You, um, there are there is that option there to bring in those old boundaries, or if it is just old data that you would like stored within Field View, um, any of those old memory sticks you have, we should be able to import into that data inbox. Just have to zip those files up first. Yeah, we have lots of customers that want to pull in their harvest data from 2018, 2017, 2019, and and this is where you'd be able to upload all of that in. So. Whether it's a, and that's the nice thing about it is once we put it into our system, it puts it into silos and it recognizes if it's a boundary file, seeding file, harvest file, spraying file, and it'll actually uh, do that as well as imagery, 
soil tests, prescriptions, and any other imported shape files. So other imported shape files could be, let's say, a seeding, a, very, a VR seeding map that you have, or perhaps a aerial application if you have your own drone imaging. Other maps like that would be what you'd be able to upload into here. And right in, right in this data inbox here, there is a file compatibility page that walks through those different file types. Um, there's the upload button, and then it shows how to zip our files, as those have to be zipped before, before we try to upload them. So lots of resources if this is something that you're, you're um, looking to do. Next thing I want to go over, Andrea, is, uh, sorry, um, was on the right side in settings. Um, this, is a, this is a great place to go for oh. some information. The first one that I wanted to go over was sharing. Oh, Click into sharing here under settings. Now, the nice thing about it is, um, you know, farmers, you guys own your data. Um, if you have a dealer that sets you up, um, you know, they don't get access to your account. You have to grant them access to your account. So it's, uh, this is where you would go and do that. Anybody that you're doing a trial with or, or agronomist, if you're doing a trial with somebody, I'd invite them to, I, I'd, I'd see if that grower will share those fields with you or that field. Um, sometimes, you know, in, in the spirit of uh, good communication and, and knowing all of, having all of the information, um, a lot of farmers will just share their whole operation with their trusted advisor. However, if you want to just share one field, let's say, or if you want to share one field and you don't want the yield data to be, um, you know, to be maybe known about with, with your, whoever you're sharing it with. So it's um, pretty neat that uh, different ways that you can share. So click on the share button. Type in the email address of the trusted advisor I want to share with. And then here I have my options to share a field, a farm, or a whole operation. If I click field, I can just select specific fields. In here I can include or exclude yield data depending on that what, uh, how that trusted advisor is working with you on your farm. And then I can click share and they would be able to view, uh, my, Troy would be able to view my operation in his field view app or the black app. Um, really handy for scouting. Um, and dropping pins within operations, keeping an eye on things. And yes, yeah, like Troy mentioned, just a great, another great way of communicating um, with those people, those partners on your farm. Yeah, like I said, it's something I would encourage you to, uh, to do. Um, what else do we have in that uh, settings tab that we want to go over, Andrea? Point out that your account information is here, your order history, payment settings, if you're looking for any of that information. Um, it is here if you are coming closer to renewal, it's potential that we might need uh, to add a credit card information into there, which can be done in pay payment settings, out of there, um, as well as our legal, our privacy policy and our end user uh, agreement can be found here as well if you uh, have an interest in taking a peek at that. I think that's uh, pretty much all we wanted to go through on the web for now. Um, we will be coming back on the web towards the end of the webinar and walking through prescriptions, uh, seed prescriptions, fertility prescriptions, and then chatting a little bit about fungicide prescriptions towards the end of the webinar. Should we move over to the iPad? Yeah, you bet. So Andrea's gonna switch yep. her screen over to, the, um, to show what she's seeing on her iPad. So, this is the screen that she's mirroring, 100% um, charge. That's why we got Andrea to screen mirror because I'm at about 4%. So um, the two apps that we're looking at there, uh, one is called the cab app. So that's the one where we're hooked up to the cab. That's the one where we're going to work, we're in the pieces of equipment. A lot of farmers, once they get onto that cab app, they just want to kind of stay using that. Um, they don't, not all of them will go and download the black app as well. Now, the black app, which is the full app, so that's the full field view app. That one, um, trusted advisors, you know, anybody else on the farm that wants to have it, download it on your phone. That'll have all of your information, your satellite images, 
um, you build drop pins, and, and we'll get into that in a little bit later. But for now, let's go into that white app. And um, we've, we're trying to uh, use that dot so you can see where Andrea is clicking. But uh, let's start with the home page. I'm a little slow just learning how to use a mouse on my iPad. It's a little weird. <laughs> so this is basically the landing page that you would get to. Um, before we get into equipment setup, um, I think it's really important to call out the settings tab because a lot of people might be downloading this for the first time. So if we go into the settings tab, there's a few things that we're going to want to review. And number one is the units of measurement. You know, we're kind of um, a mix mash of everything here in Canada. We talk in acres, hectares, ounces, um, meters, kilometers, miles, everything. We're, we're kind of all over the map, but it, it makes that most sense for me anyway if we switch that over to English, and whatever is highlighted white, that's the one you're on. Another good call out uh, I'll get you to go through, Andrea, is the, um, is the units and then the cloud sync. I was just thinking that maybe we transitioned a little quickly if anyone's still grabbing their iPod, or sorry, their iPad and wanting to follow along. I thought maybe I would just give a, give a couple seconds here if anyone doesn't have their iPad turned on or isn't logged in and wants to get logged in and follow along, let's take a quick pause. Yeah, so basically we were on the home page and we went from the home page to the bottom left corner tab into settings. And, um, you know, a few things that I'll talk about on this page is, is um, this is where our, our data is, our devices, how we get them set up and, and um, a couple of other things that we have. But first thing first is that units. Like Troy mentioned, the white is the selected one. So I currently have my iPad at English. And underneath units, we can see this cloud sync here. This is how our data is getting to the cloud or to the internet. So when I'm using the CAB app in my piece of equipment and I'm connected to my field view drive, which we'll, we'll show you what it looks like when we connect to that field view drive in a little bit here. Um, that field view drive plugs either into our diagnostic port or we have some cables or some harnesses from the back of our different equipment monitors, maybe the back of our Topcon X30 and the back of our uh, Pro 700 to connect that rate controller and that GPS so we can bring both pieces of information to create a map into field view. That drive collecting that information is Bluetoothing. If Bluetoothing is an adjective. Um, or sorry, a verb, uh, to our iPad. Uh, so we don't need a Wi-Fi connection or a data package for that. That is just using Bluetooth to get that information on our iPad. Uh, that data is being stored on our iPad until we um, get Wi-Fi or maybe we use our phone hotspot. And when we do connect that, our iPads to the internet, that's when that cloud sync will start to happen and that information will go to the cloud. And that is how it's accessed on all of your devices um, for everyone who's logged into your farm's account. If we do have our iPad, um, maybe our iPad does have a data connection and we want to save some of that data, we can disable that cloud sync uh, maybe during the day when we're just collecting that seeding data all day and then when we take our iPad in at the end of the day, um, connect to Wi-Fi at the farm there and save on some of that data. Or maybe you need all your data bandwidth to watch Netflix and you need to turn off your cloud sync for that. Um, I'm sure that doesn't happen on your farm though. Um, so that's another, another one there. And then the other one Troy mentioned is editing yield units. If I click on this, um, I think in Western Canada, something uh, that I think of is uh, lentils. So if I scroll down here um, and find lentils, usually we want, would prefer to have those in pounds versus bushels. So I have the option to do that if I have any crops that I'm working with that I would prefer in other units besides bushels. That's uh, the main, main things on here. Restricted mode, I know some growers use if they have many operators and they prefer operators not be touching equipment settings and different things like that, but I have seen um, people forget to turn that off and wonder why they can't access certain things within their field view. So usually leave that on disabled. 
some of the main things we want to go through in the settings page. Um, I think another thing we should maybe point out before we get into equipment is this help button. Hey, Troy. Yeah, you bet. Um, it's the life preserver in the middle bottom there, and, and this is a great resource. If there's something that um, you just kind of have a question about, you can just enter a ticket in here. You can put in your contact, phone number, um, you know, what you're acquiring for support, and then just a quick description. Or if, um, you know, you're having trouble, uh, wh whatever it is, uh, connecting the drive or, or if something's just not quite working for you, you can call that support number and, um, and it's, it's kind of right there, ready to go. Um, the first thing that they're probably going to ask you is what version you're on. So you, you're going to want to know where to find that, and that's at the bottom. Andrea's hovering over it right now, and, um, and it'll tell you where you are um, if you're up to date. So, you know, we want people to be using the, uh, the most up-to-date version. Um, you know, and I will put a little caveat in here. There are some people that, um, that if things are working well, they won't go and do the update. And, and that kind of makes sense because sometimes when we do do an update, um, even if it's not uh, an update that, that necessarily has much to do with your monitor or your system, we could still have, um, we could still have you know, perhaps something going on like uh, an issue or a bug that, that just affects you a little bit. So some people will do that. Um, and, and if it's not working or if it's glitchy, then uh, this is the first thing that we're going to get you to do, though, is, is to make sure that you're up to date. A couple other things that I want to point out on this help page, these help articles are the same information that we were able to access when we went to that support tab on climatefieldview.ca. So just another way to get those uh, videos and those articles. Maybe you're sitting in your tab, can't remember how to connect that drive to type that into that search bar and it would show up in your iPad as well. And then uh, cloud sync status. If you can't seem to find some information on one app or the other, uh, maybe it just hasn't uploaded to the web yet. Yeah, Andrea, I'll maybe seven. just uh, jump in here. We had a couple questions come in privately regarding cloud syncing. Uh, so the cloud sync option is in uh, that homepage, guys. Um, your iPad should automatically do this, but if you need to on the homepage, there's a cloud sync button at the bottom there. Uh, if you're not seeing that function, it's because you don't have a FieldView Plus account, so you'll have to update to that. Uh, another question I'll just touch on, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, uh, can you do field boundaries you know, manually through your iPad? Uh, yes, you could through Chrome, uh, but if you're like me and have stumps for fingers, uh, it's a little more tricky. So we do kind of suggest, you know, use a desktop and a mouse wherever possible. Yep, good call out. Thanks. So the um, the update, so people that, that aren't on, don't have a plus account, um, were, um, so there could be a few things, your, your account could be expired or perhaps um, when we went over the pricing, uh, you didn't sign up for the try it before you buy it account, but um, you can you can get a hold of us or we can you know we can put your name in a queue here and we'll be able to get back to you to help you through that process because uh, you know that's something you're going to need to be able to record data. Yeah. So you can. Thanks for that, chaps. No problem. You can see here that my cloud sync has stopped. Spinning. So if you if you maybe get to the house, uh, you just connect to Wi-Fi. Just tap on that uh, cloud sync button down here at the bottom, and it will make sure that everything that's updated. Good call out, team. Okay. So next, we want to set up some equipment. So we have um, we have in the middle um, top equipment. This is where we're going to enter in our iron. So um, pretty easy. But you're going to want to have every piece of equipment. That you have so if you've got a cedar um, a planter you're going to need that that whole that whole system so let's start off with the adding a new tractor okay and then at the very bottom it's, it's pretty straightforward but i invite you to follow along um, today i'm going to add a case um, we'll go with a quad track okay 
with like a six. Uh, yeah, go with like a six or uh, six hundred stagger or something. Yeah, six twenty quad track. Big one. The big one. <laughs> it's articulated. Nick. Well, what do we want to name this tractor? Let's name this tractor Brutus. B R T B R U T U S. Sorry. Yeah. Up next. And here we are. So with this tractor, um, we do have a lot of these measurements pre-populated, which is really nice. Um, when we're looking at these GPS measurements, it's important to make sure these are accurate because this is how we ensure that the map that our field view is painting is accurate by having these jet measurements correct from where that GPS point is. The nice thing also, it gives you a little bit of a picture on the right side there to show what you're measuring. So you can see uh, A there, that front axle to where it's, that tractor is going to pivot, and it sort of draws that out. So if we look at, um, there's a couple zeros. So the front axle to GPS right now is zero, so section E. So we're going to have to put a number in there before field view is going to let us finish this tractor. If I hit done right now, it's going to tell me that it needs that number to be a non-zero number before we can continue. So what sure. Andrea is going to do here, she's going to put in like six inches um, and she's going to just put that in as kind of a reference for now. So we're in the office, we can just put in a number to trick it, but like if you've got a list going beside your computer right now, this is something you're going to want to write down is you're going to want to make sure that your equipment measurements are accurate. So that might mean a 25 foot tape measure and um, you know a cup of coffee and going out to the equipment shed and running around and getting this. And you can do it with your iPad in your hand and, and easily able to pull up and edit these later in equipment. This um, zero uh, letter D here, uh, just is saying that that GPS is in the center of our tractor so we can leave that one as zero. When your uh, measurements are done, hit done here, and now we have the old Brutus ready to go. So next, we can add in our seeder. Yeah, so we've got an air seeder. An air seeder we're working with today. It's uh, John Deere. And the 1910, scroll down, or 18, yeah, 1990, I mean, sorry. Forget my equipment sometimes. Uh, how many rows? Um, go 70. And row spacing? Uh, 10 inch. Perfect. Drawn hitch style? Well, um, like um, like we have in Western Canada, our, our you know most of our setups are going to be a drawn hitch. So this isn't made to confuse you. This is the top two are going to be more for planters that we would have. So we're drawn. And yes, I'll that be using an air card. John Deere card as well. Or go. Oh, perfect. Which Burgo air card are we working with? Um, the 7,700. How many tanks? Four. And what is controlling our Brigo tank? We have the X35, Topcon X35. And a name for that air seeder? Um, Popeye. Yep. One word. Too late. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see there, walking through that equipment setup is um, fairly step-by-step. Step. And if you're not seeing something that you have on the list, 
Um, maybe we need to use a custom option or there's, uh, we can always use that support line to help us navigate through what the best, what the best setup for our equipment is. So here and again, 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 they're pre-populated a lot of these. Um, 219 for wheel distance to the center of the pin and you know you can keep that pre-populated number in there but I do encourage you to uh, to go and check it it'll just it'll help track better when you're making your turns um, you know it'll just uh, when when it's shut off and shut on um, your your um, seed and your fertilizer it'll just be more accurate and if all of a sudden you know you have those little red gaps at the beginning of when you start seeding or at the end then this is where you could adjust it is, is either in your wheel distance or the start and stop delay. So next we're going to go into seed exit. You can see there's a couple little yellow dots. That means we need to add some more information before we're good to go. So I go into seed exit here. Um, we need to let our, let our uh, field view know what's controlling that seed. So when we're mapping our seeding layer in field view, we can map seed and two other layers at the same time. So if we have two other fertilizer blends, or maybe we're, um, if we're doing peas, maybe some inoculant, we can map three layers while we're using that air seeder. So Troy mentioned that we had a top cone, so I would click on that controller where it says disabled, and then I could choose a top cone here as well. And then if I go um, into application A exit, that's disabled right now, and I want to put down fertilizer with that seed. So I can click in on that disabled and go into the top cone on here too. This doesn't have the hitch to exit, exit distance uh, pre-populated, um, so we can use the same for now, we can use the 228, the same as our seed exit, um, but then if we need to go into, uh, go out to our equipment and measure it to get, make sure it's 100% accurate. And I want to put down a second fertilizer, a map a second fertilizer, so I can do the same thing with application B exit, tap where it says disabled, and choose a top con, and to my 228 hitch to exit distance. Once I have my seed and two applications uh, filled out there, I can go into my air cart. You can see that one has a little yellow dot beside it as well. Um, we selected the four tank uh, count before, and then the air cart position, the in-between and the toe behind is really important to make sure that we have all of the distance behind us calculated out correctly, especially if we have a toe between, um, because that tank is it's gonna be longer, so we wanna make sure we're painting an accurate map when we're turning corners, going around sloughs, et cetera. So um, this instance, it's toe between, we can leave it at, and then we'll need some really accurate measurements for hitch to axle distance on that uh, cart, as well as uh, axle to rear hitch distance. So, Troy, do you have an estimate of what these might be? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, uh, 320 inches. And axle to rear hitch? Uh, 88. And then you can see once we have all of that filled out, those little yellow dots go away and um, we're pretty much Good to go. I'll maybe just um, ask our question monitors right now if there's anything that has come up significantly over this air seeder setup. Yeah, yeah. and uh, Andrea, we just had one come in and that someone's asking, is the seed or fertilizer exit measured from the back row or the front row? Yeah, so I think um, what I would normally do is the back row because that's where it's you're going to want it to stop and finish uh, marking. So I would um, I typically use it to the to the back. Back. Awesome. Thank you.
Good questions. Keep them coming in. Keep those people working. Um, the next thing I wanted to call out, I guess, was maybe we should just set up a quick sprayer, Andrea. It's it's pretty quick and easy, and, I, and I'm sorry for people that already have all their equipment set up, but um, we just want to make sure that, that we've got it all. So, we, again, we're in the Equipments tab. We'll hit Add New Equipment. And, and here, if you have a planter or a pull-type sprayer or, or a self-propelled combine, um, we have silagers in there on beta test right now. Um, and then there's also um, tillage implements. So if you are doing some tillage around some areas, you can still map that, that information out. But let's, let's throw in a sprayer. Kind of sprayer. Uh, New Holland. Guardian. Uh, 400. And here you put in the number of sections that you have, and I know a lot will have sectional controls, but what you look at is how many sections, how many boom sections you have. So let's go with seven. Um, 1,200. And like many, it's a rear. And we will call this one um, Mr. Happy. So here we can see a lot of this information isn't put in yet. And, and that's, um, you know, the stagger that we looked at. A lot of stuff was pre-populated because we have a lot of customers that have already pre-populated that information. We, uh, we look in, um, we will actually take them all, and then once you start to see them coming in, it's the same width and length, and then then we'll pre-populate it. But here, we don't have enough of these Guardian sprayers in, so we would have to put in our own information. So um, we can do um, B as 120, um, A could be you know, even just uh, six inches again, it could be almost uh, in the center of, from the center of that wheel to where the GPS is, center of the GPS. Um, C is, so that means it runs right down the middle of, of the uh, piece of equipment, the GPS does. And then D is boom to axle. So um, you can put in um, another 120. And again, this is just guesses that I'm doing, and they're 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 not even well thought of guesses. They're just um, numbers that I'm putting in, so I can then go back and uh, and make this accurate later once I'm in the seat or in the in the equipment shed. Similar to our drill, there we need to go into this application setup button next. So I tap into that. It's asking us about our equipment display, like it did with our cedar. So if we had a New Holland sprayer, we're likely to have a New Holland IntelliView 4 in there, so I can click that. Um, and then for my application controller, I can choose, um, it could be a number of different things. It could be an ISO product controller, it could be a CNH product controller. I'm going to choose that for now. These things are important to make sure we do have accurate so that when we connect our cable to uh, this piece of equipment connected to our drive, we're able to read the correct information and we'll get those maps painting properly. So it is good to double check exactly what equipment displays we're working with and what those application controllers are. This is also important for making sure we get the right, we do get the right cable um, and everything's going to work, work correctly. Um, support is a great place to lean on for that as well as our climate activation specialist can help out with that information. So it looks like we're good with our sprayer here, and we can hit done. So they'll be added to our list here, our cedar, our sprayer, the tractor we created. Um, you can continue to add your equipment, and hydrous applicators, all those things. Uh, eventually need to add our combines as well, but I think um, that pretty much gets us set up for, for in seeding here. Yeah, you bet. So I uh, really encourage you to be accurate with those numbers and those uh, monitors. And um, if you do have any questions on compatibility or do I need a cable, those questions, those can be found on our support page or, um, you know, type in a question now and we can hopefully um, be able to help you out with that. So Andrea is going to click on the home. Yep. 
I'll just, I'll just jump in here too because we had some questions regarding uh, you know equipment with Western Canada being so mixed match with our equipment. I, I think we sh you know we should expect that. Uh, just know for those of you that are looking at this, being like, wow, this is a lot to take in. You know, there's a lot of different measurements. You you might not know them. Uh, it's really no uh, reason to worry right now. Uh, we do have a great uh, climate activation team that I should shed some light on. So there are people that will actually help you through this process. So we're not expecting you to know all this right now. Um, just know we will help you with this. Yeah, and a lot of this information can be found in your monitors as well. So often we can help you um, virtually, you know, like over the phone. So if you were to say, I wanted to set up an appointment with uh, our customer activation team, um, I'm going to be going to the equipment shed at noon on Thursday, then, uh, you know, you guys could have a, a FaceTime or even a conversation on how to get through, find those find those measurements or just to help you out with them. So, yeah, appreciate the call out there. And, um, yeah, the, that we want to be accurate. But so Andrea has clicked on the home button and she's taken back to this landing page that we have. And, and again, we're in the white app, which is the cab app. So that's the one where we get the business done. We're, we're hooked up to the equipment. Um, and I think once we've got equipment set up, it's nice to fill up our seed shed and our applications shed. So that stuff can be found in settings. And this is homework that people, um, you know, should be doing. And if you've done it in previous years, your applications and your hybrids will be showing up in here. So hybrids is, is basically where our seed shed is. So this could be every lentil variety, chickpea, soybean, canola, corn, wheat, whatever varieties that we have, we would put in here and we would find. So it's, it's pretty easy peasy. We just want to um, hit add new hybrid. And then um, Andrea, you can put in a uh, corn variety. Okay, you see, you can see a number of different corn uh, hybrids come up here. I'll choose this one. And then we just continue to do that for all of our products. If I'm not eating 2260 soybeans, I can just hit remove. Those are from last year. It doesn't get rid of any information. It's just a, just this, just this uh, pick list here. Um, yeah, so, um, and, and the nice thing about it is, uh, folks, if you've got a trial that's going on and you're like, I don't know all the varieties that are going in, don't worry about that right now. Just worry about your main um, varieties that you have going in on the majority of your farm. And if you can remember those ones or those seed treatments that you have, um, put them in here and, uh, and then it just creates a really short list for us. So then when you are in the field and you're like, okay, I got to go from variety A to variety C. And then you can just, uh, you can find that in a quick click and, um, and it's right there. So then you're able to map that, that information and um, you know exactly where that switch is. So, and there's also times where you might have to add a custom hybrid where you're like, keepers, it's, it's not showing up on here. Um, what do I do? So you can just type in like uh, rainbows if you wanted to call your variety rainbows. Well, there are. Okay, add custom mm -hmm. hybrid. And then what it's going to do is it's going to ask, what is it? So you can say that it's whatever, canary seed or whatever and it'll um and you'll be able to have it in your have it in there as a custom application or a custom uh, hybrid sorry so hybrids is basically the seed shed fill your seed shed up and then there's the seed treatment option beside it so the beside that toggle is the seed treatment option and you know we're we're going to want to put in all of those cereal seed treatments um you know our canola seed treatments or if you're trying something new out if you're trying a primer let's say or um, or any sort of additive um, jump start another one that people will uh, will go and put on and and the neat thing about this um, folks is you know this is this is where the juice is this is where we want to like um, do those trials do that do those strips with um, with product A versus product B or or product A versus untreated check and um, you know. I, I believe in, in the products that are out there in the marketplace, and I know that they do work in certain situations, and just find out how well they're working for you so you can see if the juice is going to be worth the squeeze and, and if it's going to be worthwhile. Continuing on with it, so um, 
once we've got all of our hybrids entered in, um, I think the next step, Andrea, would you say applications? Yep, you betcha. So this is every application that we would do. This would be the fertilizer applications that we have when we're seeding or planting. Um, it would be the spraying applications, whether it's insects, pre-burn, in-crop, desiccants, fungicides, all of those would be in here. And, and this is where you would want to put those in. So um, let's add a new application. What are we adding first? Um, let's add our canola blend. I think I have a paper on that here somewhere. Next. So for uh, me on my farm, this is going to be a granular application. Finish. And then we can add products. So we might have a, um, a different mix of products in here, so we can add each one of those. So I tap on add new product get a search bar similar to when we added our hybrids and varieties, and I can start to search my different products. So like 1152, yeah. maybe. And then we can um, put how many pounds of MAP are going to be in this blend. 130. Add another product. Uh, we'll go with 21. Uh, 21024. Perfect. Another pounds. Add another product. Get our urea in there. So 4600. And here we can put this at, uh, let's go 200 pounds. With these uh, granular products, um, our total pounds per acre would be, uh, oops, my area didn't go in here, 200. Um, my total pounds per acre will be basically adding all those up so I can um, just change this by to by weight, slide this tab over here, and it's going to add up uh, total pounds that will be going down. Yeah, just repeat that, Andrea, because that's that's pretty important stuff there. So um, by by weight, we want to be on, especially when we're talking about those granular blends, and then maybe by rate, uh, would it be fair to say we would do with our our spray applications? Yes, for sure. So now that it's by weight, the total mixed amount, so the 430 pounds an acre is what's going on in, in this uh, particular field that we have, or this uh, particular canola blend that I have. So there, there could be different fields that you have where you have like your canola blend and then your canola max blend, or your, so you, you would want to put in each one that you would have, and then for each crop too. So if you had uh, your cereals, what your cereal blend is, that will go in here. So again, if you're writing down on your piece of paper beside you, this is something you're gonna to wanna to go back to and, and put those applications in. And this is just, uh, like we said, if this isn't um, mandatory, you can do all this on the go, but we do highly recommend it. Just cause it'll be a lot easier when we do get into the cab of our equipment and we all know once we start seeing, we want to just go. So the more things we can have done ahead of time, it's going to make, make that just a little bit easier and then make sure we can capture that information um, to be able to refer back to at the end of the season to see how that, how that turned out. And a lot so of these applications, guys, you're just doing one time, right? Like year over year, these are going to remain. So, you know, if I do a roundup application, it, it's going to be there next year with the same rate. So, you know, if you spend some time putting in those applications, you're not going to be doing as much work next year. That's a good call out, Chaps. Yeah, appreciate that. It's a little bit of a little bit of growing pains just to get kind of going and getting it under, getting everything set up first. But um, that will remain in. And then, um, yeah, if you pick up a new piece of iron or you pick up a new field or you change 
um, your fertilizer blends, then you would need to make the tweaks. But if it's uh, staying the same as last year, uh, those things won't need to be adjusted. Should we add a, a liquid applica uh, blend here? Or sorry, a liquid application? Sure. Um, maybe a wheat pre-burn? You betcha. So um, we'll do a... We'll choose liquid in this case. And then we can add uh, hopefully more than one product in all of our pre-burn to make sure we're doing a tank mix um, with our Roundup. So we'll start with Transorb. Um, and it wants my Transorb in gallons. The nice thing about that is if I tap on gallons, I can change this over to um, milliliters or liters. Uh, so if I go to liters here, then we can put our Roundup at 0.5 liters, I believe. Yep. And then let's add in um, some Olympus as a tank mix partner for that pre-burn. And then that Olympus, uh, it's again, it's not going on at gallons or liters. It's gonna be going on at grams. So this is what I was talking about earlier, how we just kind of, and a lot of times I, I feel you, I know what you people are thinking out there right now. Um, why can't it just be acres? Per case, um, that's not an option that we have right now because of so many different case sizes uh, globally and, and especially in, in North America here. So that's what we have to deal with with Olympus. We're going to be putting that down at six grams per acre. And then we still need that application base rate. So what do we usually put it on? We know when we talk about fungicides, we're usually, you know, north of 12 gallons an acre. When we talk about a lot of in-crop, it's 10. But, uh, you know, Roundup and Preburn, Roundup's one of those great herbicides that uh, they simply work better with uh, less water volume. And it's uh, five gallons is, is what usually, uh, you know, people are using out there and have the best success with. So, uh, as you can see, Andrea left it on by rate, not by amount. And what that's doing is that's, um, that's giving us the rate. So, that's, that's where we want to be with those spray applications. So I'd invite you to put it on for wheat pre-burn, wheat in-crop, have your in-crop in there. So again, on that piece of paper on the side of your computer here, you're gonna wanna put in all of those applications. So your, all of your in-crops. Um, and, and if all of a sudden, you know, you have to spray an insecticide, you can do that on the fly, but it's just nice to have all of these applications there tied together just in case it's not you and the equipment or if plans change, you know they have. Awesome. So um, that once you're, whoopsie, sorry, once you're happy with that, we are we're good to go. And the next step is probably tagging some of those specific uh, applications, hybrids, seed treatments to the fields that we are um, going to put those products in. Uh, here again, just another step to make things a little bit easier, a little bit quicker when we're in the cab, especially if you're not the one operating that equipment just making that uh, set up one step, one step easier. Yeah, so Andrea is gonna go into home. Yep. And then in the right there is the fields. And, and uh, some people, um, the, the, the reason that we like people to use this, this option is when you pull into your field, it geo-recognizes what you're going into. So it, it says that um, let's go down to the field that we just created. What did we call him, uh, Pete or Dr. Mm, Money? Dr. I can't remember. Dr. Money Field. Okay, so when I'm driving up to Dr. Money Field, um, it's going to say, you're entering Dr. Money. Do you want me to make this field active? Yes. And then it's going to give you a list of what you should be doing. So let's say you have, um, you're growing um, Liberty Technology and Roundup Technology canola on your farm, you would know that you're entering that Liberty field or that Roundup field. So hopefully it, it'll alleviate any 
um, missprays or miscommunications in there. So we want to put in what varieties we're putting in. So let's mm -hmm. put in some canola at the top, 7565RR. Now nah, let's get some true flex going. Kate, you got it. Now true flex, true flex 96SC. And some jump start on there. And then applications. Um, I have a canola blend from before that I can select, or I've already added in. And then maybe a canola foss, just extra that I have on top of my blend. Um, because, like I mentioned before, we can map seed and two other products. And then in this application, I would also want to make sure I'm putting um, my pro line if I'm planning to spray a fungicide, which I usually do. And if I don't have that in there when I go to take my field, it looks like I do, I can add applications on the go. I do have pro line in there, so I'm going to add that in for my fungicide. And then if I, like Troy mentioned, pre-burns, um, insecticides, all those, all those uh, different things will all be tagged to that field. And depending which equipment we're in, if we're in that seeder, it's gonna bring up um, that seed, those seed options, and then when we're in the sprayer, those application options. So that looks like we should almost have everything in that field, maybe besides that um, in-crop roundup application, which uh, I have right here. So a whole bunch of things that we can have pre-populated for that field. I think that looks good. Yeah, and, um, and like I said, if all of a sudden you're you're doing some custom work for somebody, or you pick up another piece of land, um, you know you can change this on the fly as well. So while you're seeding, you'd be able to put in the hybrids you have because we've made that short list that we have of seed treatments, hybrids, and, and applications. Okay, so we have equipment, we have a seed, we have seeds and applications figured out. We even have it tagged to our field. So I think the next step will be connecting that drive and actually going to seed this field. Um, unless there's anything else you want to mention, Troy, before we do that, or any of our other people who are answering questions. Keep the questions coming in. I see them flowing in, so appreciate that, everybody. So um, here in my office, I have a cable that allows me to plug my field view drive in, and that way we can kind of look at what um, what is our screen is going to look like when we connect into our our equipment and we have our drive plugged in. So if I've never plugged my drive in before, the the place I'm going to go to is the um, is my iPad settings. So I'm going to go out of my tab app for a second, and I'm going to go into my iPad settings. And I'll just call out that um, whenever we Bluetooth connect something for the first time, this is something that we have to do for everything. So if it's a speaker that you have, um, it, and it always seems like the first time that we, we Bluetooth connect something, that it's a little bit of a, 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 maybe a more, one more step, but after that, then it's easy to kind of connect to it. Now, the caveat that I'll have is I know there's people on the call right now that have, let's say, two combines or, or two seeders. Um, and so you'll have two different drives and iPads. I would keep iPad A with drive A. I would keep iPad B with drive B. So whether that means you get in the label order and, uh, and putting that information on there, it just makes it easy so then when the tractors pull up beside each other, if one's turning on and the next one's turning on, they're not trying to connect to the other, um, to the other Bluetooth um, drive. So, so Andrea went into her settings here and um, and was able to connect to it. I'll let you I'll let you go back. Take it, Andrea. Okay. Thanks. No, that's a great call out with uh, keeping those iPads and drives as buddies. There, it just works better. So when I plugged in my drive here, it first flashes a, a quick green, um, and then it starts to flash blue. And the blue flashing light means it's trying to connect to Bluetooth. So in this case, I haven't paired it to uh, my iPad. So it's flashing blue waiting for it to pair. So when I click pair here on my screen, uh, you'll likely get this pop up too if it's the first time. 
And once I click that pair button, my drive stops flashing blue and goes to a solid blue. And when it's that solid blue color, that means it's connected and uh, it's connected Bluetooth to my drive. So if you're having some issues, it's good to just double check and make sure that drive is still Bluetooth connected to your iPad. So in my settings here, it says my Harvest Demo drive is connected. Um, that's just a drive I happen to be using, the name it has right now. Uh, you can change. When you first connect your drive, it's likely going to be, um, sorry, it's likely going to be along just a string of digits, so a number of uh, letters and numbers all put together. So I'm going to go back into my tab app. So I'm going to click into my tab app here. And it says it didn't like that. So people know that um, that that long number that Andrea was referring to, if you look at your field view drive and you look on the underside of it, um, you know, that nine pin diagnostic drive that we got that would come in those little little boxes, um, there's a number that starts with A, so alpha. Um, and then if you look at the those numbers, those are the ones that your drive will be. So um, mine here end in 7F76, and I see Andrea's are 73EBF. So you're, um, you're able to find that there. And that's one way to notice if you've ever, um, you know, like which, which number, which drive you're actually hooked up to if you don't have them labeled yet. They are stamped. So Andrea's went into the into the tab app and then she went into settings and then devices and I'll let you take it. So you can see that this drive is now connected uh, in my tab app here so it has that green check mark beside it. Before we go any further I want to just take a second to click on this edit button. Um, if you've never paired your drive to your equipment before uh, and it's the first time you're getting ready for seating, I really encourage you, once you have everything connected in your equipment, to click that edit button and go into the diagnostics tab down here at the bottom. So this diagnostics tab, currently mine are all gray because I'm not actually in a piece of equipment. I don't have my drive connected to a GPS and I don't have, in this case, um, uh, it automatically connected to a sprayer. Um, which once uh, the field view drive, it's, it's uh, really, it is quite smart. So if you, even in this case, I had unpaired my drive and it automatically went to the last piece of equipment that this drive was active on. So once you pair it once and con connect your equipment, it's going to automatically go back to that piece of equipment that you used last time. So in this diagnostic tab here, I'm going to do my pre-burn spray as my first, my first thing with field view. When I get in my sprayer, have my everything hooked up, I want to make sure that these are turning green. So when I'm sitting in my yard and I have my sprayer on, that GPS needs to be at at least one hertz to show that it's going to be able to map. It's going to have um, one of the buses active, and those, so these will change to green once they're active. Um, it'll recognize that the engine's on, and then the application rate won't turn green until you actually turn on that sprayer, until there's actually something running through uh, that rate controller. So this is just a good way to check to make sure that all of our cables are kept connected in uh, properly and that our drive is able to read the information from our equipment. Those will look different depending if you're in a sprayer, cedar, or combine. Um, the combine will have things like moisture and yield versus application rates. Uh, uh, laid out there. So just something to check and um, to make sure that everything is connected up properly. So I'm going to go out of here. You can see my drive still connected. I'm going to go home. If it's the first time you're doing this, you're going to get a pop-up asking you to set select your equipment, which will mean a tractor and a seater if we're going seating. I'm going to go to my home button and go into my equipment and actually select my tractor that I'm looking for. So if I was switching equipment, this is also what it would look like. I'm going to hit set active on my uh, Brutus tractor here. And it's going to connect to that. And it, it selected a corn planter, which I don't want. So I'm going to choose uh, the air seeder we created, Popeye here, set active. And now I can see at the top 
my two pieces of connected equipment. Uh, so that means that those are what I'm going to be using to map and, um, for the first for the first application because I want to show you guys what it looks like if we were seeding. So now that I know I have my correct equipment selected, I want to tap on my home button and I want to go into my map screen. So in my map screen here, uh, I don't have a field selected yet. So if I tap on um, a field, I think Tri mentioned this before, if I'm actually all connected up in my tractor with my drill and I get to the edge of the field, it's going to give me a prompt uh, that says, do you want to make this field active? Because it knows where we are located because we're connected into that GPS. So I'm going to select that field we created today. This is similar to the pop-up you will get if you're actually on the edge of that field. So yes, I do want to make that field active. And you can see on the left side, there's a, a number of different boxes. Some are yellow and some are green. Um, and it wants us to make sure we fill in those yellow boxes before we start. So this pop-up came on its own because it doesn't know what crop we're planning to seed. So when this pop-up comes up asking us about um, hybrids, I can go tap to select. And remember, we tagged that TrueFlex hybrid to this field. So it's at the very top of my list as a field hybrid. You can see my season hybrids are underneath here. And I do have that option to add a new hybrid uh, if I needed to. So say I get to this field and I just I realize that I'm actually planting a uh, true flex club root variety, I could tap on that add new hybrid if I didn't have it there and do that on the go if I needed to. DKTF, and then I can choose that club root hybrid instead. Another thing it's gonna ask me is what tank. So it needs to assign a tank um, as well. In this case, I'm just going to choose tank one, click done, and you can see here I have my hybrid selected, and then I can go to my seed treatment. So tap to select the seed treatment. I chose Jumpstart. If I was doing my cereals, I could choose Raxel Pro. I'm going to select Jumpstart, hit confirm, and then you can see that that variety tab at the top of my screen went from yellow to green and it shows that I have that TruePlex hybrid, I have my jump start, so that box is ready to go. Next, it's asking me about my application. So tap to select. Um, for this field, I had a number of applications. I'm gonna choose a canola blend for one and select a tank and choose tank two, click done and then confirm. And then uh, that one went to green. Now my last application, application B pops up. Tap to select and I'll choose that canola FOSS blend. Doesn't quite look like FOSS, but that's okay. Um, confirm. Sorry, first we have to select our tank, tank three. Done and confirm. And now all of our uh, tabs are green on the side. And if I was actually in a piece of equipment, uh, this would be painting. This is just a demo, so it's not, not painting currently, but this is what it would look like in, in the cab here. So um, like we mentioned before, having those things laid, up in, uh, laid out in those first specific fields just makes things a little bit easier from the start. I wanna point out a couple other things while we're here. Um, underneath those green boxes, there's an edit button. So if I click on that edit button, I can customize any of those tabs on the left side of my screen. So um, there are a number of different options. I encourage you to figure out what, what makes sense for you. Um, one thing that I would recommend is this drop pin button. So if I tap and drag this over, uh, maybe I don't need to see my application uh, rate. Now I have drop pin on the side. So if I scroll down, the other one I want to add is a custom map. Once I have my uh, customized pins all done up, I can exit that. You can see I have dropped a, a pin here before, but that drop pin is really nice to have uh, easily accessible as I'm driving through my fields and I see uh, maybe rocks or something we need to want to uh, need to look back at or check back at. 
I can hit that drop pin button as I go. Uh, I know that we've used this before on our farm. The person in the cedar drops all the pins, and then uh, usually I hand the iPad to my brother and tell him to go pick up all those red rock pins that I dropped. So a uh, oh, helpful way that some people have used it in the past. And the nice thing about this, Andrea, that I like to call out is uh, the pin type. So if it's a problem that shows up every year, like let's say it's a big uh, big stone or a big deadhead that, you know, is kind of on a ridge or something and you, you, you can't get the ripper in or the tractor in to get it out, you can make that a permanent issue. So pin type, she's toggling over from seasonal to permanent. And, um, and once it's white again, that's highlighted and that means that's the one it's on. So... Um, and, you know, the, the pin dropping feature um, is something that lots of people will use for uh, anything from, hey, we need to go back and reseed these areas. This is the low-lying areas that we didn't get to. We're going to put this into oats or, or whatever. Um, you know, um, I think uh, oh, it's a good way to communicate with your agronomist in the season. And, and one thing that I wanted to call out on when we're in this view as well um, so once Andrea has saved this pin, it's all saved there, but you can remote view in. So if you are um, if you want to remote view in and see exactly what's going on with your with your novice operator or, or your dad perhaps, and you wanted to see, you know, where they are in the field, how productive they are, you're able to toggle through all of those edit map option things on the left and kind of make them your own. So put your own in on what's important to you. And, um, and in fact, you can drop pins as well. So... That's pretty neat. And then, um, you know, there's also split screen option here as well, which some people want to look at. And when they do the split screen option, they can look at, let's say, um, satellite images. So if you wanted to look at, um, right now she's in population, um, but if we go into like in season, so planting, and then here we have field health. Andrea can look at other images that, um, and, and maybe she doesn't have them downloaded quite yet for this field um, because it is a new field, but um, then you'd be able to look at a satellite image besides. So some people will use that um, when they're spraying for, um, for flea beetles, let's say, or they're spraying and, and they're like, oh, maybe I can get away with just spraying the first two passes because this is the area where there's defoliation. As we know, flea beetles come in from, you know, field borders, margins, ditches. So, you know, you could use stuff like that to, to look at anything. Or if you're harvesting and you wanted to see where was that trial. So if this was a population trial that you did and now you're going through with the combine, you'd be able to see exactly where that trial was. So being able to collect that live data um, as you're going. Hey, Troy, can I just jump in and uh, give an example here? Please do. Yeah, yeah, you touched uh, some great examples on what we use the field pins for. Uh, something that we use out in God's country here is we've been doing permanent pins for uh, field probes. So, you know, if you're doing your old, own uh, soil sampling, you know, drop a permanent pin uh, and then you can do, you know, uh, another pin on the driveway and upload all your results so that those are permanently there and you can go back and see, you know, uh, where, where you've done probes and go back year to year and try to probe the same area. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for that. Before we disconnect the drive, I just want to point out that custom map at the bottom that you can see is still yellow. So this is an option that we added uh, late, uh, maybe mid to late last spring, so that you can map anything else. So the field view is going to record um, seed and fertilizer for you, uh, population, depending on if you have a planter or a seeder, there might be some other planter metrics that it will record. But with that custom map, we can kind of add in anything. So something that I think maybe could be an example of this is uh, seeding depth. So if I'm putting, if I want to do a little bit of playing around with my seeding depth, I could use that custom map option. So if this is going to be let's see, seeding depth. Um, and so my first depth maybe is going to be uh, one inch. And then it's going to start mapping that. And then when I get to, maybe I do two cedar passes of one inch depth, I can tap that again and enter my new zone, um, zone name. So maybe it's 0.5 inch or whatever it looks like that you want to uh, map differently or just keep track of. 
you can add that in and it will create colored maps just like if you had a change in hybrid, a change in fertilizer rate, et cetera, uh, just to be able to keep track of any of that. So really encourage you um, to, to, to record those things. If you are making changes and wanna be able to uh, capture yield at the end of the year, it's really nice to have those options to paint those different colors of maps and then be able to have a way to easily identify where those different breaks in the field were. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what we'll be doing when we're mapping. Um, I think uh, uh, a private question here, guys. Can we uh, take a second here? Sure. Um, wondering if we're entering all this information into a top con man a monitor, do we still have to enter this information twice? Good question, and the answer is currently yes when it comes to hybrids and blends and um, drill widths and equipment measurements, the answer would be yes. It does have to be entered in both places. It doesn't necessarily okay. have to be entered in the X35. There are people that will use field view as their data collection and their X35 as their um, ways to apply it. So I don't know that it necessarily needs to be you know, that level of detail in the X35. But um, I guess if you want that checks and balance and backup um, for the time being, I, I would kind of, I would encourage it, I guess. Great, thank you. Any other questions you can answer there, God's country? No, that's it for now. <laughs> okay. I will disconnect my drive. And because this wasn't actually painting a map and maybe some of you uh, haven't seen a lot of maps created in field view, I just wanna go to a field that has a, has a map already so you can see what it would look like um, when we create that planting map. So this is just an example of a grower who had multiple hybrids in this field. You can see the different colors represent a different hybrid. Uh, every time they, ha they did have to manually change the name of the hybrid, um, but then it creates a map like this. So the nice thing about this, depending on what you're looking at measuring, whether it's fertilizer, fungicide, seed treatment, if it is seeding depth by those custom maps, these are what your maps will show up as. So it will change color every time you change something. Um, just so you're able to easily keep track of where where those changes are. And then that way, once you do have that yield information, you can overlay that and we can make sure we're uh, running those trials on our farms and understanding what makes sense, uh, where we need higher rates, where we need lower rates, different products, um, and that sort of thing. Do you have anything to add, Troy? Uh, yeah, I think you nailed it. This is um, this is the parts that I like. It's the uh... It's the way that your trial is, is laid out. It's not now looking and your three telephone poles over in your field and you kind of swooped out and did a little teardrop and that's where the trial starts. This is geo-referenced. You can walk in um, into the field. If you have your location services on, it'll show a, a blue dot on exactly where you're walking. So, um, you know, Andrea can split her screen and she can look at different vegetation. She could look at harvest yield. She could look at uh, moisture at harvest. So, um, you know, you're able to kind of, it's, it's not necessarily like people ask, can you overlay the lap or the maps? You can't necessarily overlay the maps, but you can look at them side by side, which is probably gives you a little bit more clarity. So um, all of the legends on the right um, for the bushels are, are editable. So if she can click on that, edit, and there's an auto adjust, which I recommend, you know, starting out with. And then some people like to change the steps, and that just basically means what the clarity of it is. Um, and, and a really neat one, so Andrea is in a corn example here. If she goes into moisture in the same kind of harvest, as, and, and you can see the difference in varieties when, you know, on how things perform with, you know, what, it's telling more of the story, I guess, on, on what the moisture is and, and what's all going on there. So. One, one, one thing that people do run into, and, and I know that there's a couple of people on this call that, that have uh, done this before in the past, and they've they said, maybe I set up too many trials on each field. 
they've got so much stuff going on and they don't know how they can accurately tell on, you know, what was worth it. So, you know, I do invite you to do a trial on every field, um, but don't do 10 trials on every field. You know what I mean? Don't do seeding rate, seeding depth, and then do fungicide the other way, and then another variety trial over here or there. Um, try to, uh, you know, somewhat keep it strategic. And right now, just think about what are, where are some places where maybe you could, uh, you know, maybe do a little bit better or, you know, save a little bit money or, or perhaps maybe spend a little bit more money and, and make a lot or just things you want to try out, um, those three or four things. Seeding depth, seeding rate, seeding speed, those are fun ones, and, um, you know, it can tell you a lot and save you a lot, too. Awesome. So I think uh, we've got about a half an hour left here. So we should go into the full app, the full field view black app for a couple minutes, and then uh, walk through some prescriptions, and then we should be able to wrap it up uh, at 1130. Yeah, so this full app, uh, we can download on our iPhone. We can download it on our Android device. Um, and this will basically give us the information that um, we've collected from the, from the equipment and then also satellite imaging. And, you know, there's a few neat things that I, that I guess we're going to show off on this. And, and for me, one of the biggest ones is uh, just that communication. So, um, you're able to look at information, um, like let's say I'm an agronomist and I've got five customers on field view. I can, I can scroll through each one of my customers if I want to. Um, and so I, I got their satellite image. I know what variety they, they've got in there. I know when they've, when they've put their application down. And then I could also aggregate information. So on the right side, Andrea is going through that now. It's probably just coming up on your screen now. Just um, these are all the people that have agreed to share their operation with Andrea. And, um, you know, like I said earlier, you folks own your data. It's, uh, it's yours to share who you want with. And Andrea is just going to go through her operation today because those people have agreed to share with Andrea, not necessarily everybody here. Um, what are some of the things you want to start off with? Maybe let's just make a quick mention about our rainfall our weather capabilities. Um, this is something that's here to use as a tool. It might not replace the rain gauge in your yard, but it does give you the opportunity to get a good idea of how, where maybe rain is across your farm. If you have fields 20 miles north and 20 miles south or whatever that looks like, can give us a little bit of an idea of what would have been on those fields. Um, since yesterday and since midnight, depending on where you are, there's definitely some mixed feedback we get about how accurate this information is. Um, so that, uh, depending on where you are, I would keep an eye on to see if that's something that you're interested in looking at. And that season to date um, ends up being pretty accurate. So just a quick explanation of how we get this weather information. It is based off of radar cloud cover. So the since midnight and since yesterday information is often an estimated guess based on what our radar stations are showing us. Of course, here in Western Canada, we don't have as many of those radar stations as we do even in Eastern Canada and in the US. Um, so just depending on your location um, in regards to where those are, also things like large bodies of water, uh, some of you guys might be closer to the mountains, uh, anything like that is going to have an effect on how accurate this information is. So it is there as a tool, um, but w with a little bit of, of caution that it might not be 100% accurate all of the time. Uh, besides that season to date, that does get pretty accurate because we are chewing that up with local public weather stations likely closer to your farms than some of those radar stations. Um, and I think that 10 year average, sorry, that compared to 10 year average, that last column there can be a helpful indication maybe in season when we're thinking about fungicides. Are we uh, way above, way below? How does that correlate to other years uh, in the past? So that's just uh, kind of what I wanted to mention about the weather. Troy, do you have anything to add? No, I think you, uh, great explanation for sure. Awesome. So let's maybe spend a couple more minutes uh, in field health here. If I tap into the field health box 
Um, these are the field view satellite images that are sent to you. Uh, depending on cloud cover and the weather that we're receiving and even smoke in the air, that will depend on how frequently you get them. So in a lot of cases, if we have a decent season, you will see them once, uh, once every week to once every 10 days. I know there was instances last June where we had cloudy, rainy weather for almost the entire month. And unfortunately, that meant we did not see images through there because we, we were taking pictures, um, but they weren't of any, weren't, wouldn't have been of any use to you. There was poor quality, had clouds in the way, smoke in the air in some instances. So we weren't able to share those. Um, if you have a plus subscription or signed up for try it before you buy it, you will start to see satellite images for the boundaries that you either draw or add in within 24 hours of adding those boundaries, as well as three years historical satellite images. So at the top here, you can see we have scouting and vegetation. Um, we also have the option to a couple filters at the top on either side. So if I'm just wanting, maybe I need to scout my canola fields for cutworms, uh, I can do that. I can just look at my canola fields. The other one here is newest name or lowest biomass. So if I'm looking at maybe significant uh, changes in biomass. If I tap on lowest biomass, and it's going to give me my fields, basically have the highest amount, highest percentage of red or lowest biomass in there. So just another way to sort. If I want to look at it that way, I'm going to leave it at newest for now. Um, and I'm going to flip over to vegetation images for a second. These vegetation images are all on the same scale. So with these images, we can compare the field across the road from the yard and the one right beside the yard. Um, so they, the brown will be the same scale as, as the different fields. So it is a way that we can compare all of those fields. The scouting images are more amplified versions of those vegetation images, but they are, cannot be compared from the field across the road to the field beside the yard. They are measured on the individual field boundaries vegetative biomass. So red um, in one field could mean there's absolutely nothing growing, and in the next field, red could mean just a thinner crop span. So don't get alarmed by the red in, in each instance. It's just meaning the lowest amount of vegetative biomass. So if we go into a field, um, demo field health here. Do you want to walk us through some yeah. scouting? So, um, yeah, the first thing I want to call out is the year. Um, let's, let's look at a different year because there's not a lot um, from 2020 yet. Everything's going to be pretty brown. So go 18 or 19, doesn't matter. Um, and then if, Andrew, on the left, you scroll all the way down to the bottom, that'll show kind of, I'm going to call it the frequency that we typically get. And that image that's up there right now, that's a good example of those ones where, you know, there's probably a cloud over it or there's something going on um, wrong there, um, whether it's a cloud or a shadow or, or smoke. Um, but I do want to call out that um, the frequency of it, so, you know, we probably get images more often than we scout most of our fields. Our, our satellites go over more often than that, but like Andrea said, there's those times when, when we just can't get to it. Uh, let's click on um, May 20th. Okay. And, and this image that we're looking at, so the scale on the right is basically taking the highest vegetation, highest biomass, and it's painting it dark green. That's the top 20%. The bottom 20%, we're painting red. And now there could be a five bushel difference between that red and green. We're just showing you where those differences are. And also the dark green could be a kosha patch. So when I started um, walking fields and scouting, I was taught to do the W formation. Um, also tried the zigzag formation. And, and um, if I would have had this tool when I started off, I'd be able to take a lot more strategic approach. I think a lot of people, when they walk into fields, they're able to see about 2% of the field. Now you can walk in and you can find those areas that are dark green. Now, if Andrea clicks on those top, or those three dots in the top right corner, there's an option that says show my current location. Now, the cool thing here is it'll show the blue dots on exactly where you're walking. 
So at any time, Andrea could drop a pin in the bottom right. It's, there's a pin drop option, or she could hold her finger down somewhere to drop a pin. So then she could see, she can take that strategic approach, walk those dark green areas, those red areas, and when she finds something, she can, let's say it's flea beetles, she can drop a pin right in there, flea beetles, and then um, just put in a note there, and the note could be, uh, you know, spray insecticide down to one plant per square foot. And then she could take a photo. Um, so take a picture of the defoliation that we're seeing or the issue that we're seeing. Um, and then after she takes the photo, it'll be uploaded in there. Again, make this a seasonal or permanent pin drop. And, um, you know, insects are obviously going to be seasonal. And then um, whatever color you want to go, blue for bugs. Um, and then right below the save button, there's a button we call the more button. It's got a box with an arrow pointing up, meaning more. So click on that more button and that allows you to share it. So Andrea, if she was hooked up to uh, cellular data right now, she'd be able to actually text it to me or she can email it to me. Um, there's other different ways you can save it to her files. So, um, so now, and this person that she sends it to, they wouldn't, and you can do this from your phone, everything we're showing you here, you can do this from your phone as well. She'd be able to uh, text it to somebody that doesn't even have a field view account. So if you're, let's say, talking to your insurance adjuster and you just had hail damage, you'd be like taking your pictures, giving your definitions and explanations, have all these pins dropped, and then you could text them to that individual. They know exactly how to get to that field where you're seeing the issue or the damage or, or whatever you want to show that person. And, and like I said, they don't need that. Um, they don't need that. The, the map location is a hyperlink on the bottom um, where you can just push and it'll take you right through. So quite like the scouting feature. And again, this is a great reason why you want to be sharing your operation with your uh, trusted advisors or your people that are scouting your fields. Um, you know, if anybody that has, that does scouting on your farm, um, you know, I would encourage them to, uh, to download the app and, and um, you know, be a part of that operation so they can take that strategic approach. Um, so once, once you've got that done, I'll, I'll get you to close that out or save it. A um, couple other call outs are uh, the, the cloud button. So the cloud button kind of right in the center bottom if Andrea clicks that, it'll show the actual image, what the picture was that the satellites had taken. And this is a good way to look at, um, you know, was there, was there any cloud cover there? What was going on there? This is a good one that you'll see all the clouds. So this is, this is why we couldn't upload or, you know, uh, can't get much information from this, this image. So um, a lot of them, they don't pass quality and control. This one's kind of the, uh, I'm surprised that it did. But, um, you know, all in all, we, uh, we would know better than to look at that and put much stock into that. Um, if you click on the fields tab on the bottom, Andrea, this is where I, um, this is where I typically, the view I look at when I'm in my, when I'm in the black app. Uh, maybe you're freezing up on us. So this is, this is the one where, you know, I can see all of my fields if I'm driving around and, and whether it's on my phone or on my iPad and, and you can like scroll on the left, whichever field you want. And, um, and then you're able to click on that field and go, go right into it. So that's kind of the view I, I use. And, and you can see that blue dot where Andrea's uh, hunkered down there. Looks like West Side Saskatoon. Hope you got your doors locked. Um, Only the so, <laughs> um, so she could click on any one of her fields here and it'll take her right to it and then able to go into those scouting things. So, Awesome. So that kind of covers imagery and scouting. Um, and so if I was a dealer or an agronomist working with my customers, if I tap where my name is in the top uh, right-hand corner there, that's where I could change. If I'm just going to scout uh, Ambrose's field, I could click into his operation and I would only see his satellite imagery and be able to access um, his field. 
Um, any other quick comments about, looks like we only have about 15 minutes left. So we probably okay, let's should. just go to the home page here again of the Black App, but I just want to call out the uh, notifications. This is the landing page. Again, we went through rainfall, field health. Yield analysis is really important. It's more important than the fall, so we're not going to go through that right now. But notifications, so any rainfall report that you got, any new imagery that you got will show up on there. Or if somebody has finished a field, um, you can set up those notifications. And then also um, any activities. So that pin I just dropped showed up there. Um, and then as seeding or spraying or any of that is happening, it will show up in that activities. You'll have a list of what happened today, what happened yesterday, to be able to keep track of what's going on in your operation. And just a quick point out on this Slack app, or sorry, in this field view app here, the help button at the bottom, um, there's that phone number, that email address again. Like we mentioned, you can find this the web or either app, um, and that's where it is there. So for the last few minutes, um, I'm gonna jump back to the web and we're gonna go through scripting quickly. Um, with scripting, like everything else we've talked about, there are a lot of online resources. Um, if we go through it quicker and you need a refresher, uh, YouTube, the website, um, reaching out to uh, your local payer or climate person can help you find some resources as well. So I'm back on the screen here on climatefieldview.ca on my computer. Uh, this one recommend using a mouse. Um, we can now connect mouses to our iPads, but kind of recommend the desktop. It's a little bit easier to work with when doing things like drawing prescriptions. Um, so I'm logged into my account. Uh, we were in this field tab before where we added a field. I'm going to go to this top tab prescriptions up at the top. And it's gonna take me to a different area uh, of the web where I will create my prescriptions. So with this drop down here, I can search um, my prescription field that I want to use, demo prescriptions here. So I don't have any fertility, oh sorry, I do have a couple fertility prescriptions that I've already created. I can also create planting prescriptions. I'm going to go into new, create new prescription at the bottom of my page here on the left hand side. Uh, going to start with a manual fertility prescription. And it's going to show some previous zones that I've already drawn. Um, but for today, I'm going to start, um, the, oh, likely the only option you will have is draw your own zones. I'm going to select that, draw my own zone, start with that blank slate and click next. Um, asking us when we're going to do this, um, I'm gonna put this down, my bono variable rate my seed for, variable rate my fertilizer, sorry, when I'm putting it down with my seed. So I'm gonna choose in season. The date um, doesn't really matter just around the time when you plan to do it. I'm going to leave May 15th as the date here. And then for my fertilizer type, uh, select nitrogen and use urea. Not liquid. There we go. I don't need to worry about my incorporation method, and I can just use uh, that file name for now. Once I have that filled out, I can click down in the bottom right-hand corner and choose Finish in Editor. And like Andrea said, there's a great YouTube video on this, so if you're, if you're not able to keep right along here with this, we're going to kind of give you the high points and, and the points we need to pound through, but um, this, is, this is also in YouTube form. so. Don't get stressed out if you're not able to keep up. So we just have this blank map here, but if I go down to the bottom right-hand corner of my page, I have a change map option where I can click more maps and then choose any of the, my, uh, if it's in season or imagery, so scouting or vegetation maps, harvest, maybe prior planting maps. I'm gonna start with harvest and go into yield and use that uh, yield map as my starting point for my prescription. So now I can see I have my yield map. Um, and if I go to the top right-hand corner and click draw, choose my polygon similar to my field boundary, and I can start to create my different zones. So as I start here, going around uh, these higher yielding areas, 
hit save when I have my first polygon done and I can continue to add in um, my polygons around the different areas of my field. So this is the manual fertility and I can create as many zones or as few zones as I would like. Yeah, somebody that's just getting into zone creation and, and doing it on their farm, and I know there's a lot of people out there that, that are just thinking, hey, I just want to stop putting salty fertilizers in my saline or, or alkali areas. Um, I want to, uh, you know, just reduce the amount of product that I'm putting there and maybe start to, you know, build up my hilltops with sulfur or something like that, something that maybe uh, is a little bit more mobile in the soil. So, so I'd encourage you to, to keep it simple. At first, you know, make your three or four zones. And this is the nice thing about Andrea having historical yield data. So if you do have those old combine maps, um, that's the way a lot of people made um, VR maps when they originally came out. They basically did combine removal rates. So what your removal of the yield was, that was the nutrients that they would put back into those areas. Some people have different theories, but like I'm saying, this is a great tool for people that are kind of tippy-toeing in and want to, want to get started into uh, in making their own VR maps. Um, you know, I would consider three or four zones, but if you wanted to get, um, you know, really pull the Band-Aid off, I, I guess you could go uh, 12 zones or more if you really wanted to. I drew four zones currently, but I only want to apply three different rates. You can see I have those three that are maybe my highest yielding areas of the field. I can click this merge button in the top right corner um, and then select each one of those higher yielding areas and click save and it will merge those into just one. So I have one rate for all those highest yielding areas of my field. So if I, when I'm clicked onto those, uh, you can see that it highlights zone two here. So if I wanted to add a rate to those highest yielding areas of my field, um, I could do that. So for today, I'll just throw that at uh, 100. Um, and then if I look at um, this, this orange area, this is maybe the lowest yielding area of my field. I click on that, it's, that is zone one right now, so I can add a rate to that. Maybe I'm gonna put that as uh, 50, doesn't need as much fertilizer. And then the rest of my field here, I can click that and it's at zone three. So the rest of my field, I'm gonna put at 75 pounds maybe, or whatever those numbers look like uh, that makes sense for your farm, whatever zones you have drawn out there. Nice thing when I add those numbers in, I can see my prescription summary at the bottom on the left-hand side here, and it shows the average product rate and the total tons uh, that I'm gonna need. This shows a little summary. So another neat thing that I wanted to talk about was the change map. So this is the nice thing about having the historical yield maps we talked about. There's also um, elevation maps that we, we get from, um, from seeding and from planting. So if you wanted to look at um, you know, elevation from your planter, and if that kind of told a little bit of a story, because you folks know your fields, you know where those lower lying areas are, and you kind of want to find that line to perhaps, um, you know, cut out those, those salty um, nutrients in those areas. Um, this one, for instance, um, you know, the elevation map is a, looks like it's a rather flat field, but um, also another one would be satellite imaging. So, you know, you see where that high vegetation is in peak season, and I'm calling peak season like, uh, you know, July 15th or, or, or maybe 28th, somewhere in there. You know, somewhere around there is when we'd have uh, high vegetation, and it would possibly tell us a bit of a story. So you can use those as a reference, too, um, to kind of help you with those maps or help ground truth them. And um, I think one thing that's a call out here is when you are using stuff like this, it's, uh, you're gonna, you almost have to have an intimate knowledge of those fields. You know, it's, it's pretty tough for, um, for just anybody to do it unless you, you really um, are getting keen with this, this operation. But anyway, um, it doesn't take long to do. Once you get them here, um, you basically have to push the save button and I'll, I'll pass it back to Andrea. So she's up in the top right corner there. I always recommend hitting save as soon as you're happy with it, just to make sure we're saving our progress and you don't lose that. Um, after you save it, I will likely need to export it so that we can take it to our equipment monitors. So with this export button here, um, I have the option to, 
to download it. Um, so if I click download, it's going to ask me about what type of file I want. So this is where we'll need to be familiar with that equipment monitor that we're taking this prescription to. Uh, if it's a Virgo, we're using a Topcon X3035 like we were in our example before, we would need a generic shape file. Uh, John Deere, depending on what our Pro 700 might look like, we might need a different file type for that. Uh, Raven Viper, if it's a liquid prescription going into our sprayer. Uh, lots of different options here. Um, so just being familiar with what that equipment monitor might need. And then we will select, I'll just choose generic shape file, hit download. That uh, download will end up in the download folder on my computer. Most of you likely have one of those as well. And then we'll need to unzip that folder, copy it to a memory stick and take it to our monitor. So the steps for those different monitors can be found online as well. Uh, another great resource may be your equipment manufacturer, the tech people that do work at uh, your equipment manufacturer uh, locations. They can be a resource for doing this as well. They often have a lot of experience with those monitors, as well as our support team. And then online, there's some resources. So that's a basic fertility prescription. Um, I'm gonna close out of here. And for you guys in air quote, God's country, maybe seeding some corn this year, interested in um, maybe changing up some populations, getting the most out of that seed and where we're placing it. I want to go into create a new prescription again, but instead of fertility, I'm going to toggle over to planting and go into corn and use this advanced planting prescription here and hit start. So this is one of the things in field view that will be an extra charge. Uh, currently, it's $1.50 an acre. I'll walk through what it looks like, but if you are interested in something like this, there are some promo codes we can get you a couple hundred acres to try out for free. So if that is something you're at all interested in after this, talk to your local Bayer representative or um, your climate field view uh, dealer and we can get you access to that. So with these... Um, just to call out Andrea, this is uh, just, you know, um, make sure that we know that this is for corn and soybeans and that's it. Yeah, more so even corn than soybeans. Um, and we need some historical data when we're doing this. So um, FieldView is making a recommendation based on your field um, and some historical information as well as research data done by Bayer. So it's making a recommendation on the products that you're using and historical information. So in 2019, um, we need to tell it what crops we had. So I can say I planted soybeans. In 2019, 2018 was corn, 2017 here was edible beans, so I'll change this field health data to edible beans. 2016, it grabbed my corn data. 2015, winter wheat, and maybe 2014 was a poor year, so I want to remove that layer. Um, you do need one year of corn yield data. Uh, it just makes it more accurate when it's making recommendations for your field. Once I have that information filled out, I can hit next. Um, and here is where I can add my hybrid. I'm going to choose a DeKalb hybrid. Um, I'll choose one of these. I'm not as familiar with my corn hybrids and where they need to be. Um, you can see here some of them have the word tested behind them. That means there is an extensive amount of Bayer research done and population research. So we are uh, making a pretty accurate recommendation for you. So target yield, I'm going to choose 200 bushels. It's asking about our seed cost, but $350 per bag and a $5 per bushel grain price, and then click next. So this is going to create population management zones for us, like I said, based on historical information, your satellite imagery, as well as that bigger research data that we have. It created five zones for us here. Across the top, you can see you have the option to adjust. So perhaps I'm just getting started and I only want three zones. I can change that and it will create a new recommendation for me with just three zones. And it saves those recommendations along the bottom. If I'm a grower who likes to have a, a higher fertilizer plan, maybe I want that higher yield uh, bump up, it's gonna give me a higher population recommendations to get that higher, higher yield environment. So I can play around with these and create different scenarios. I'm gonna go back to the original recommended population map and click finish and editor. 
This now gets us to the same screen as we were with our uh, manual prescription. So I have that option to change my maps if I want to look at yield maps, vegetation maps, etc. I also have the option to adjust my population. If I feel that these recommendations are too high or too low, I can work with my agronomist on this uh, to help make sure I get the best recommendation possible for my farm. So that's kind of a quick rundown of that. Probably doesn't apply to a large number of growers on the farm, but there might, or on the phone, sorry, but there might be a few. Um, and again, if you have questions, feel free to reach out, um, support to your Bayer rep, your field view dealer, um, or check that information out online. There's lots of walkthroughs on how to do this online. Yeah, okay. you bet. So we're probably coming close to the end here. I, I did want to, um, you know, thank Andrea for helping me present, and I wanted to thank uh, all the customers out there and, and support staff out there for our customers that are listening in today and tuning in. Um, be safe out there this spring, and, um, you know, thanks a lot for your time. And I'm going to pass it back to uh, to Chaps. Yeah, no, thanks, Troy and Andrea. You guys did a great job. Um, we are uh, right out of time, so I'll be really quick here. But, uh, you know, thanks again for joining us. Hopefully we all took something out of this webinar. Um, you know, make sure you review it on YouTube once the videos are up. Uh, you can kind of get a refresher there. If you do have any further questions, we try to keep up. There was a lot of questions, so that was great. Um, but if any of them didn't get answered, you know, reach out to your Bayer TSM or call that support line, you know, that 1-888-924-7475. Uh, they can help you, uh, you know, answer any questions. Uh, so again, thank you for joining us. Uh, make sure you do the survey at the end to get those TCA credits for those of you that can get. And like Troy said, have a safe and uh, successful season, everyone.